Welcome to the first ever Greek wine webinar. This is the wine geek sitting next to my buddy, the wine dog, Doug Frosty yeah, Olson. Yeah. yeah, we're going to talk about Greek wine. I hope you guys are ready for this. This is brought to you as an European Union program, the country of Greece, obviously, and the Hellenic Foreign Trade Board. And we're just thrilled to be here. And we have some really special guests that we'll introduce in just a few moments. And some beautiful wines, which you should have in front of you right now. I'm sure they do. They, they got them all. Yeah, did they? Yeah. Okay, well, if you didn't, sorry. No. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Go out quick. Go to the store and buy them. <laughs> so um, I, I, we're talking to an audience here that is obviously very sophisticated and that knows Greek wine well. You are some of our... Our, our fondest admirers and people that we love the most. So we're not going to spend a lot of time on 101 today. We've got some of the greatest winemakers in Greece with us today, and we're going to really dig deep and try and get answers to your questions. To that end, if you want to go online and send us, well, obviously you're online already. If you want to send questions, please do, and we'll be happy to field them to the appropriate people on our panel. But we're talking about a country here, just as a reminder, in case you don't know it, that is the country that introduced the world to this culture of wine, on the table with food. We're going back 4,000 years. This is where it all began. But what we're really addressing today is a renaissance. The renaissance of winemaking in Greece that has really happened over the last 20 to 30 years and this new generation of winemakers who have gone out and worked in some of the greatest wineries in the world. They've gone to UC Davis and University of Bordeaux and Roseworthy and they brought back modern technology and made high-tech new world wines. Wrong. What they have done, which I think is most exciting to us, is they've learned about modern technology. And they brought it back. But they brought it back with a sensibility that we admire. These are wines of place, and we'll talk about that throughout the course of the day. These young winemakers have brought back their skills and their knowledge. And what we have learned in the last 20 years, and maybe timing is a big part of this, is that wine is made in the vineyard. And they have the most amazing vineyards. We're talking about, in some cases, very high elevations, very, very difficult conditions, ancient soils, remote vineyard sites, old vines, some of which have never seen a phylloxera, some of which are still on their native rootstocks, very low yields. And these winemakers and all of the ones on this panel and all of the wines that you see in front of you today and hopefully you'll be tasting with us are made with indigenous grapes that they have embraced, that they are making great wine from this great terroir. That is the, the, the precedent that we'd like to set. That's the way we'd like to start this thing. And Doug, I'm going to throw it over to you to come in on a little bit of this before we introduce our illustrious panel. Yeah, as a place, I mean, I think a lot of you have already been there, but if you haven't, or if you have, always good to remind ourselves of, of what a remarkable landscape this really is. That, you know, we're talking about 9,000 plus miles of coastline, you know, hundreds, uh, frankly, thousands of islands, most of which are uninhabited. But nonetheless, ocean is, is a huge influence upon uh, virtually every vineyard there. On the other hand, as we move up into the hills, we move up into the mountains, so we move up into places like Macedonia or Macedonia, now we're dealing with elevation being even more, uh, uh, even more a, 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 you know, a distinct influence upon what's happening, as well as a little bit more of a continental climate. So climate becomes you know, we talk about microclimate all the time, but climate becomes even more stark in contrast one spot from another. And, and so that's got to inform part of what we're talking about when we talk about a wine of place. What is that sense of place? What is the place that's speaking? And, and certainly terroir, as Steve has already alluded to, we've got a lot of different soils, but if there is something in common, it is this idea that they're depleted that they are impoverished, that, they're, that there's, you know, in places like Santorini, no organic material whatsoever, and that there's a diversity of soils. Again, a place like Santorini comes to mind, but as we look across this landscape, a great diversity uh, of soils. One of the issues that I cannot help but try to emphasize as much as possible is while the, the, this campaign, if you will, talks a great deal about the four big grapes, and obviously we're gonna look at the four big grapes here, that the indigenous material that people have to work with here has been only in the last 20 or 30 years been given the respect that it's due and then indeed probably one of the reasons that we're here is that it probably doesn't yet get the respect that it's due internationally or is only beginning in in that realm that in other words people are still trying to understand these grapes i think that we're dealing with some winemakers here who do understand them and, and so we'll I focus think that's a safe bet. Yeah, yeah. i think so so we're going to ask them those questions, but 
you know, as, as somebody who's still in, uh, very much involved in this, I'm trying to understand what is a Sirtico, what should a Sirtico be, what should my standards be, what should my uh, standards be for a, a grape that, were, that, that was just recently rescued from obscurity, like Malagos, yeah, that, that grapes like Moscafilaro, is it something simple as it seems to be, or is there more complexity there? And then when we get to the reds, acidity again. Now, you know, we use words like tartness, maybe refreshing, crispness, all of that stuff to say the word. Let's let's talk about it because we are, you know, mano a mano here. You know, we're we, we're all in this game. We can talk about acidity levels. We can talk about pHs. That's what's remarkable about these grapes, and that's what re is remarkable about these grapes in this warm to hot climate, hanging on to tartness and acidity and refreshing character far better than it has a right to do. But Again, that's that's an outsider's viewpoint. Maybe it's a good idea to talk to some other people and get a sense of that. Absolutely. I would just add to that, you know, you, you mentioned this idea of acidity and ripeness, and, and that is what makes balance in wine. And and to us, I think, we're just, we marvel at the way these wines can get so phenolically ripe. The grapes can just hang out there forever, and yet we never get high alcohol levels. Rarely do we see high alcohol in Greek wines. Don't we say we want that? Isn't that Aren't what we, looking we for that? say as an industry? We Food want. friendly, right? Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and we always see this high acid, incredible high pHs in many of them, low alcohols, and beautiful sweet tannins in the reds. It's, it's remarkable. It's what we're looking for everywhere else, and it happens naturally here. So let's explore how that happens. But to do that, let's, shall we introduce the panel? Please. Um, I'm going to start all the way on the left, if I may, and work my way back because you're going to be first with the first wine, if I may. Um, and just brief introductions now. You'll learn more about them as we go. But all the way on the left, um, from the family winery, Kiryani, uh, Stelios Butari, just Hi. to his right, from Alpha Estate, Anglo Yetridis. Um, the woman that basically got us all started in this country, um, I met Sophia, what, a decade ago, and we've been working together ever since, and she really got all of us motivated over here and brought these winemakers and these wines to us, Sophia Perpera from All About Greek Wine. And finally, and I'm going to start with you, Apostolos, Apostolos Spiropoulos. Apostolos is the perfect example of exactly what we've just been talking about in that he went to UC Davis, he worked in other places, he learned about what was going on in the rest of the world. Then he came home to one of the oldest wineries in Greece, where his father and he now have been making wine for a very long time, certified organic. They're in the Montania Plateau in the Peloponnese, and they make wines, well, we're going to specifically talk about Moscofilaro and its diversity. We see it here in its white form, it can be sparkling, it can be rosé. Um, I would like it, if you would, Apostolos, to just get us started off on this idea that I'd, that I'd started, what it was like to bring this technology back, and then come up with your dad, who's making wine the old way, and, and come together to make absolutely beautiful wines. Well, it was very challenging, mm -hmm. but on the other hand, it was very interesting, very important. I think also my dad understood that from the first uh, time I uh, came back and started working. And I think uh, what uh, I really brought back, it's uh, the willingness and the understanding to explore, to experiment and see and try to figure the real potential of uh, the variety in the place and the terroir. So I think that's the main thing uh, uh, we brought back. Well, let's talk a little bit about this first wine, because this is indeed Moscow Filaro, and this indeed comes from the Montania Plateau, which is where your family estate is located. And tell us a little bit more about the diversity of this grape and, and what you like about playing around with Moscow Filaro, because you have done so many different experiments and you're making it in so many diverse ways these days. It's a fantastic variety. It's very unique. It's grown in uh, the Montania Plateau for a long time, not for as long as Adorini, but a long time still. Uh, it's a gray skin grape. Uh, it's characterized by high acidity. Imagine that we're talking about Greece, but we still harvest in October. There were harvests that uh, we finished harvesting almost November. And this is a result of the high elevation. At high elevation. We have uh, uh, cold winters, snow. I mean, you see the winery in the vineyards covered with snow, something you don't imagine uh, for Greece. But on the other hand, also we have, because of the elevation, warm summers, warm summer days, and cool nights. So that's why we have very nice aromas and uh, this crisp acidity. Absolutely. Uh, so this, this variety is very versatile. Uh, the appellation is only for white wines. Finally, from the 2012 harvest, we have appellation sparkling wine. Finally. So it's, uh, it's something we're trying to do for more than 10 years, and finally we made it. 
And uh, for uh, and we, what we managed to do two years ago is to have the rosé wine as a PGI, which was, so that was something that uh, uh, traditionally the wine there was made the rosé. You know, people were making the wine the traditional way. They were getting skin contact, so a lot of color extraction. The wine traditionally, my grandfather was drinking rosé wine. So it would only make sense when I came back to start making a rosé wine from Moscofilero. So this is a really interesting and which are very, beautiful. They're beautiful. They're lines. beautiful and very unique. Very unique. Um, you, you mentioned DOs, Appalachians, PTIs. I'm going to throw this over to Sophia to talk a little bit more about that. We did finally get this Appalachian for sparkling wine, um, and you mentioned now that we have whites and so forth. Can you just um, allude to some of the exciting stuff that's going on in Greece right now with the, the entry into the EU and how things have changed a little bit? Okay, uh, well, first of all, we have several new appellations. We have 33, 33 appellations. Uh, what used to be called OPAP, now uh, all the appellations, uh, OPAP or OPEP, now all of them are called the PDO or in Greek POP. Um, and we have several, um, and, and all of our uh, VANTEP uh, uh, appellations, uh, now they're called PGIs. Um, there's some exciting new appellations like for Malvasia, for Candia in Crete, uh, um, uh, which else? Crete, Crete has uh, two or three more appellations uh, that, that mainly for, for sweet wines and for dry wines. Uh, well, speaking of yes. appellations, yeah, let me, let's, let's talk about question. this next question. Well, I was, I was okay. just going to toss one of the questions, actually Jean Wilson had asked the question, Apostolus, that, uh, you know, it sounds possible, then, and Sophia as well, um, that there are places in Greece that have a very long growing season. So if the grapes are hanging out there for a long time, Jean's question was, how could the alcohols possibly be low under these circumstances? Well, it's the, it's the, it's a grape, it's a vine, yep. it's a place, yep. it's a climate. I mean, it's that simple. It's that simple. Everybody has in mind in Greece has a really warm, hot place. Well, that's not the case. In like Sinoma area, Nausa and Madinia, we harvest late. Uh, the variety, everything, all the conditions give us late harvest. Very interesting, very nice. Sometimes some years not very good. So we do have vintages and some vintages are b good or bad, you know, or better or not that's good. Uh, some people think that uh, we have a steady warm climate and every year we get the same things. No. Uh, it's very interesting. Mm -hmm. so, so the bricks are not that high, ultimately, and no. the acids, the, the In Madinia, we and never get rise, more than 12% alcohol. Yeah. Yeah. It's impossible. It's very rare to get something more than that. Good. Well, let's move on I to would, the second one. I would one. just say yeah. that the first time that I vi visited Stelios and his father, there was not only snow on the slopes, but uh, we were planning a ski trip. In Greece, I will have, and just to put this into perspective, it is the third most mountainous country in all of Europe. And I'm shocked to think that you were planning a ski trip. Can't imagine Go that. Figure. <laughs> Can so, you imagine? But let, let's talk about glass number two. Let's um, do it. And this and is a beautiful wine. Angelos, uh, I, I turn to you on this, but uh, you know, glass number two is the Yaravasilu Malavasia. Um, you know, it is a. It, for me, this is a remarkable grape, but it's a remarkable story. Certainly, because it's a grape that was rescued from obscurity, if not extinction. So, Angelos, do, do you mind relating that story just a little bit? Yes, uh, you know, Yorbasileo, uh, the winemaker, uh, 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 brings Malaguzia from obscurity, like you, you told me, and uh, is a grape variety that uh, uh, stylistically is between uh, Viognier and uh, uh, Muscat. So, there are many versions of. Uh, of uh, uh, Malagusia, depending on the area that uh, is growing. So it's a is it is it the area? Because this is one of the things that makes me crazy about Malagusia that you'll get you know these rather almost Sauvignon Blanc uh, like aromas. You'll get these wild floral aromas. You get these rich apricot aromas. It seems that it's capable of many uh, uh, faces. Is it clonal or is it terroir or is it both? I believe it's both. I believe what what we are calling in Greece. The French call uh, a terroir, we call it ecosystem. Uh -huh. So the ecosystem plays a, a huge uh, role, what is about uh, the expression of uh, Malagusia variety. And if you allow me to add to this, uh, we've seen that uh, when it's uh, cultivated in northern Greece, we see more stone fruit aromas and uh, more peach, you know, apricot. When we see it in southern Greece, uh, we see more citrus. Um, it's really and and it's um, which most people would think is reversed. 
Mm -hmm. yes. You'd expect to have this yeah. interest in the northern, cooler areas. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Actually, yes. no, it's, uh, where it's planted yeah. in the south, it's, it gets it's more, more citrus. It's more citrus. And uh, it's, it's one of the most wild, uh, most popular. More and more wineries uh, are planting uh, Malaguzian now. Oh, yeah, yeah. absolutely. But what more wineries don't know is that it's really uh, difficult to grow Malaguzian. Yeah. It's yes. a lot of care. Yeah. Very careful. Very susceptible to disease. Yes. Yeah. It needs a lot of love and tenderness. Yes. Ah. You have to yes. be a long time in the in the vineyard, yes. and they take care of uh, this variety. Is there a particular soil uh, or, or a climatic condition, uh, but certainly soil condition, that that Malagusia seems to to uh, mm. to like? You know, uh, there are uh, no uh, mainly uh, Malagusia seems to like light light soils. Yeah. Uh, and poor soils, uh, yeah. sandy soils. And uh, these are soils that are uh, low fertility soils though, that um, give balance to the Malagusia vine. So mm -hmm. the result is a, a nice, well balanced wine with a, a nice, crispy acidity, complex character. This is what is Malagusia. And Malagusia, uh, 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 you, know, you see, it's uh, you see different Malagusia concerning the pH, the, uh, the, the the potassium concentration in the soil. So it's a, critical parameter to have distinction in Malagusia expression. I see. Well, please do take the time, if you would, to ask any questions that you want to. We'll, we'll get them uh, filed in here, but I think we're ready to, to yeah, well, drink more wine. Yeah, wine number three, just in the interest of keeping this moving, although it's really hard for me to get past those first two. Yeah. <laughs> They're both just such beautiful wines, and I'm, I'm such a big fan of both of those. Um, in wine number three, we have um, the grape Assyrtico which I would assume everyone watching this knows a lot about. We've been talking about it a lot. It's become the darling of the U.S. sommelier, which is quite remarkable considering that 10 years ago, most people in this country had never even heard of the grape, much less tasted it, unless it was in a sweet wine like Vinsanto. Um, and today we're going to talk about the drier version, but um, I think everybody understands about this island and about the volcano and about the volcanic soils and the fact that it's never seen phylloxera and the soils virtually have no nutrients. What I'd like to do is focus in on this idea of what I'm coining as pruning and planting. I call it like one word, pruning and planting. This idea of the, the, the way... Pluning. Pluning, I like that. Pluning. The way that the vine is cultivated in Santorini is absolutely unique to the world. It's actually the way it was done for hundreds of years around the world until we had phylloxera. Because phylloxera has never been there, it's continued. And as a result, the theory is by many of us that essentially these vines are 3,000 years old. But for sure, the average age for most of these vines is 80, 90, 100, 110 years old. Now, what many people don't know, because we automatically associate Eustelios with Sinomavro and your family with Nausa, that in well, Santorini, yeah. you have your family winery from way back when. And that you well, my, out a my lot first of time harvest there. was in Santorini. Your first harvest. Yeah, before I ever did a harvest in Nausa. So, so yeah, and, and we know that. And I think it's really interesting for people to know that that's where you grew up, basically. So can you talk a little bit about this idea of ancient I grew up vine? professionally. <laughs> ah, wait a minute. That might be more information than we need, OK? <laughs> well, you know, it's, uh, there's no question that Santorini is like spearheading the Greek revival. It's really a unique grape. And uh, um, this is really what, what makes it so, 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 so important. I think the combination of the soil and um, and the climate there, and the fact that you have these root systems that go back 100 years, more than that. So what happens very often when, when, when a vine gets really, really old, they don't just uproot it, they just cut it and then let it grow again. So although the, the, the root system might be like 200 years old, the plant above uh, the, the, the earth um, can be 10, 20, 30 years old. But it's the roots that count. Uh, and and uh, you see, it's uh, 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 something, uh, something else that's very important about the, the Sandorini vineyard is that it's not 100% acertico. You have the other varieties as well. Now, there's a debate there. Some people say that the other varieties help the wine. If you ask me, if it was 100% acertico, if, if we were able to harvest at the same time all this acertico, and if we, we can able to take uh, the um, same age acertico grapes and vinifying them together, we would have something unbelievable. I, th I think there's a, there's a lot coming to Santorini in the next few years. Um, uh, 
Sorry? Field blend. Sorry, uh, because they're filled uh, blends. Yes, yes, the, the blends. I think, I think 100% acetico uh, would, would, would definitely be much better. Yeah, and, and some people are doing that. Yes, yes, that, yes, right? yes. But yes, we yes. see a, a theory. Yeah. We see Aidani mm -hmm. uh, blended, particularly in the sweet wines. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Maybe uh, even though we have a dry wine in front of us, why don't we take a second and perhaps talk a little bit about the sweet wine? Because for many of us, mm -hmm. uh, we found Greece through the dessert wines, through yes. the muscats and the island wines. Well, uh, and, and now, of course, it's almost because we're so excited about the dry wines and what's happening, right. we almost think of the dessert wines as an afterthought, and yeah. I hate that. Yeah. I want to make sure we don't lose track of that. And Vinsanto is one of the great wines in the world. Well, Vinsanto and Samos. And Samos. Uh, 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 yeah. A Samos really Limnos. unique wine. These are wines that can stand at any table, and uh, yeah. they, they would, if you triple the price, you, they would still sell. I mean, it's really yeah. unique wines. Uh, 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 however, the, the, the sweet wine market is difficult. It right? is. It's, 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 not, it's, 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 it's not easy. It's not easy. Unfortunately um, for us, until people figure it out, the prices remain yeah, right, incredibly exactly. low. Incredible. Not just for the sweet wines, but for all of the Greek yes. wines. Yeah. While we're while we're we're out there, all of us teaching and trying to get people to drink it. Mm -hmm. I'm scratching my head going, do I really, really want everybody drinking these wines because they're getting more expensive now <laughs> with the economy and so forth. So and, 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 and there will not be enough in a while. <laughs> there, is a, there is a question that, that came up, as a matter of fact, James. And, and maybe uh, we'll come back to some talk about dessert wine later if we have time. Yeah, you know, yeah, we can talk some, about some of the other dessert wines. Sure. Yeah, that James Melendez was asking, which you know, I'll throw it to you, Sophia, first because you've dealt with our market for a long time. Uh, but it, it speaks to exactly this issue, which is, his question is, you know, why is it that Greek wine still is so often segregated to the Greek restaurant when clearly it's a, you know, whether red or white, we're dealing with wines that are accept accepting of a wide variety of foods. So, how, you know, particularly with the dessert wines, uh, you know, the frustration for me is that these wines, dessert wines, are so stable, they could be open, poured by the glass for a relatively long period of time and be safe and stable behind, you know, in, in the, in the reach-in, and yet people sell them by the bottle and wonder why they don't sell. So, you know, the wider question really is, what is it that is working in terms of getting uh, the, the rest of the restaurant industry to understand and be accepting of Greek wine? Uh, you know, is that where we should be placing our emphasis is in a, in a bistro or, or in, a, in a, you know, a, a continental restaurant or American only fare? Of course, that's uh, the, the Greek wines, uh, they're great food wines, okay, for, for the Greeks, uh, wine is a food. And they go well with so many different cuisines, and especially um, Asian. I was I was last night at a fabulous Korean restaurant uh, that had uh, four or five Greek wines on their list because you know, and they go they go so well with so many different kinds of cuisine, not only Mediterranean and Greek. But uh, I question the the fact that uh, Greek wine is found in Greek restaurants. I think one of the reasons why. Greek um, wines are not uh, more available found um, is because not unlike Italy, Italy, uh, the, the main reason why Italy is the number one importer in the U.S. is because in all the thousands of Italian restaurants, there are Greek wines. This hasn't been the case for Greek uh, restaurants. I mean, especially, uh, you know, the Greek diners, the more, the more casual Greek restaurants, they didn't have Greek wine. Sometimes they didn't even have wine. So... Um, this is starting to change because also the level of Greek gastronomy is much, much higher. There are about 25 top Greek restaurants now in New York, and of course they have Greek wines, but um, this, this wasn't the case until recently. This landscape is definitely changing very, very quickly. That's I mean, why you are here. Yeah. That's, That's exactly why we are here. Why we were here. Yes. Yes. That's right. Uh, that's it's a great question. Yes. And what we try here is to make the Greek wine as uh, an impression, yes. as a memory to the consumer. This is why yes. you are for here. They, they have to feel the yes. difference. The, 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 the consumer have to feel the uh, unity of the Greek wines. Yes. And, well, and, and if you let me add one, one little thing, Greece is one of the few countries that the wines pulled the cuisine. And first it was the wines, the wines first became known, and this pulled the Greek gastronomy and became popular, at least in the US. Yeah, very much. This is uh, different than the other countries. Well, and I think we're at a um, kind of a tipping point right now because what we're seeing in the country, and, and the, the point is very well taken on the question, it is still an issue, but at first we just wanted to get a Greek wine on the most important wine list in the country. Well, we've done that. Virtually, well, everybody watching this right now virtually has at least one or two. What I'm seeing that I think is incredibly exciting is that great restaurants now don't just have 
a Greek wine or two, like a category of Greece. But they might even be breaking down the categories, for example, exactly. Moscofilero or Assyrtico or perhaps Santorini, Peloponnese, you know, and, and that is, I think, the sign that we're at that turning point, that things are starting to change, that people are having four or five or six Greek wines and breaking them down categorically. And I remember how long it took some of the other countries to do this. It's happened, let's face it, this program has only been going for eight or ten years in this country, at the very most. And people are still learning about this constantly. So, well, and, and I think another thing is that um, you know, wines, if you go back 20 years, we're not, we're not up to par. I mean, l l let's be honest, right? Let's be I honest. Mean, there, there's been a, a revolution there. Not, no, not a renaissance, it's been a revolution. Yeah. The last I agree, it's not a renaissance, it's a revolution. It's a revolution. The second thing is that we never had mainstream distribution. It's the first time that we have mainstream distribution. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, it's little steps like that. Yeah, there, there's little also, while things. we look at what has uh, clearly changed, there are certain things that have not changed, and, and what, one of them is this uh, notion of you know, these old vines, these old indigenous varieties, and organic wine growing and, and uh, even making. That, you know, so if you, do you mind speaking to that, the idea of biodynamic may be a little bit uh, new to Greece, but the idea of organic or non-chemical winemaking, you know, it, it, and wine growing, most importantly, is completely natural within, yes. uh, you know, within the, the Greek wine landscape because no one has ever felt the need to use chemicals in, or, or pesticides or fungicides or things of that nature in the vineyards. Can you help us understand that a little bit, why that might be true there? Well, um, if you think of the average time that um, um, we use pesticides in Greece, I mean, it's so much less than the average um, uh, European, let's say, uh, vineyard. Uh, because of Greece's climate, uh, we use we use much less. I mean, for, uh, but I think the the word here is uh, sustainability, and this is what um, um, most of the wineries uh, they um, cultivate their vineyards uh, sustainably. Uh, around around the country, and there's more and more organic and some um, uh, biodynamic as well. But we we didn't feel so much the need because it was um, it, it's much more natural in Greece. I mean, Santorini, for example, could have been the whole appellation could have been organic. Um, for, for Greece, it wasn't just a, it wasn't marketing. It wasn't marketing yes. organic. Mm -hmm. It was it was a way of living. That's quite how we live. So it was more natural and effortless, and uh, actually the last years we think that maybe it's also a marketing tool. Yes, yes. But almost everyone makes wine organically already. It's just yes. not certified and there are organic. People that exactly. they're, uh, there are people that they're making organic wine, uh, they're just not certified, but they do it because they understand it, they, they love it. But they don't maybe get that uh, it's going to be also a great marketing tool for some markets. I'm not, I'm not sure because we talk about the importance marketing and yet I did a seminar a couple of years ago in Las Vegas where that was the demand everybody wants to know about organic wines we, not only did we work lots off to find wines that even bothered to label it organic we ended up with six wines of which only one of them had it on the label five of them didn't even put it on the label we just knew them to be certified organic and nobody cared mm -hmm. nobody wanted to come to the seminar they were all out in the Bordeaux vertical right. or whatever it was. So, um, well, I have a question. Yeah, yeah, we're, working on. we're working on I have a question here for me <laughs> from our buddy okay. Ken Fredrickson. You. Yeah. you all know Ken, and he's been a, a proponent of Greek wine from day one. Hi, Kenny. How are you, buddy? Um, and the question, which I, I will be happy to answer, but I, I, well, it's for everybody else listening, I think, Ken prompting us. How do you get the consumer to understand the difficult varietal names? And my answer to that simply is that the, every single one of you out there watching helped us get the consumer to say things like Gruner Veltliner. Yeah. And if we can say that, we can certainly say Assyrtico, mm -hmm. Moscofilero, Xinomavro. But the point is very well taken. If a, if a server cannot pronounce the wine, they will never sell it. And so it's up to us to make it easy, to make it simple, to make it straightforward, and to make it so that servers can talk about it. So this is very important, and I will say this, on your website, All About Greek Wine, it's an incredible tool I've turned hundreds of people onto. They actually have a person pronouncing the wine and the grape so that you can listen to it and practice, and that is an unbelievably valuable tool. Um, and the question becomes, will the platform for sales be based on varietal name or region? 
Well, I think here we've talked more about varieties, varieties. Than, yeah, no, than region because we've decided that, for example, Assyrtiko, we all love Santorini, but Assyrtiko is now planted all throughout Greece. And while it will never be Santorini, mm -hmm. it can make very interesting okay. wine. Same thing with Malaguzia. I mean, it, it started with Evangelos, but now it's planted everywhere. Yeah. You're growing it all the way up in Amindio. Totally different expression and absolutely gorgeous wine. So I think we're going with the grape varietal idea, but I'd be curious to hear their comments because these guys are yeah. out there on the streets every day and, Plus and at the table every day. The market buys with grapes. The market buys the names of grapes. Well, also. Americans do. Americans, Americans yeah. do. Americans so, do. Because and, we took. We and that's how say, we that want was to. our recommendation. Yeah. That's how we yeah. want to, yes. to interact with, with wines. We want to know about the grape first because that gives us some expectation of knowing what the flavors will be. And then, you know, the more, if you will, the more scary flavors, the more finesse uh, flavors are those which come from the region. But speaking of flavor and, and, and grape, yeah, let's, let's, let's talk about Ayoritico. And so different. you can call it St. George if you want, but Ayoritico is not that hard to say for crying out loud. And uh, it's certainly. <laughs> in, it is the most difficult. <laughs> Yes. Exactly. And, it when took it comes, me the longest. <laughs> and when it comes in rosé fashion, it's the easiest to drink too, right? Uh, yeah. Apostolos, it's do you want to tell us a little bit about uh, your experience with I, this grape? I, I would say that here we have a rosé wine from Ayurvedico. I would say it's a really yummy wine. Yummy. That's yummy. I mean, Great that's word. what I, th I think when I smell and enjoy this wine. Uh, it's fantastic. Yeah. And, and Ayurvedico, Nemea is the largest uh, video zone in Greece. Uh, it uh, has a huge variations. It's planted from 200 meters altitude to Nine like a thousand yeah, meters altitude. Meters nothing, and we're yeah. talking about slopes, we're talking about uh, plains, we're talking about different kinds of soil, we're talking about limestone, we're talking about sand, clay, everything. So very versatile. Uh, and that gives us also the tool to create so many different wines. So you can find uh, red wines, fresh red wines that have minimum oak probably a couple of months or three months. They are more fruity with the cherries and the strawberries and very nice velvety mouth. You can go more to what I call classic Nemeas, which are uh, for higher altitudes, 400 to probably 700 meters, when you get there really nice fruit, uh, but the, with the potential of aging, uh, the oak they give some spiciness, it gives fantastic, fantastic wines. And then we have over 800 meters, like Asprogabos and this rosé here, that they give fantastic rosés. I mean, practically you don't need a winemaker. You just go there. You just go there. Or you'll be out of a job. Get, get the grapes. <laughs> I'm telling you, get the grapes, healthy grapes, excellent grapes. Just do a straightforward rosé vinification. That's all. It's magic. You don't have to do anything else. Fantastic uh, wines. I love that. <laughs> well, it's a remarkable grape, certainly. And but this is a remarkable region, you say. And while we often look at these high elevation areas, 750 meters, 900 meters, what have you, to end up with these rosés, even within, let's say, those, those middle slopes, whether we're talking about you know, Kutsi or Gimno, just as two examples, you know, there, there are very different um, soils very different involved soils. there. And, you know, uh, Gimno with a, a, a steeper aspect to it and Kutsi with a, a gentler, let's say, aspect to it. Those, once again, allow us a diversity of, of characteristics, a diversity of styles. And I, I think one of the questions that I'd throw the, to the panel really is that if we're trying to get people to, to know certain grapes, then there ought to be a standard, shall we say, style that allows us to know what to expect every time we get an Ayurvedico. But having said that, I really wanted to, to undercut that statement and to say, no, is it really necessary? Is it that people are likely to want to explore a grape if they're told there are many different versions of this grape? They're all good versions, and and uh, you know I wonder about that. Do you, uh, Sophia? Do you find it difficult to market Ayurveda because either of its name or more uh, uh, strikingly because it has such diversity of stock? Well, uh, Ayurveda, as I said before, I think it's the most difficult, and for that matter, we are. Um, I think we're inclined to be uh, the only grape that we're probably going to to name the appellation, Nemea, which is the, the, the area where Ayurvedico mm -hmm. is grown and so much more easy. Um, one thing I want to mention about Ayurvedico, and, and I think it's important for this market, um, the U.S., they li really like having seafood, but, uh, but they like also to have red wine. And Ayurvedico is the perfect wine for this. It has so soft tannins that you can have the wine a little, uh, a little bit chilled. I really like my Ayurvedico's chilled. And um, it's a perfect match for so many seafood dishes as well as, uh, as the evident, you know, meat and, and 
and cheeses. And... Well, and, and here we are talking about the diversity of this grape and yeah. the range of styles. Yeah. And in glass number five, I mean, we're going to take it to the yeah. opposite end of the spectrum here. Yeah, yeah. Um, this is the Scurus. And this one um, is crazy. I mean, well, it's, it's all, all the things you just talked about. You know, now we're at much higher elevation. Now we're at very, very low yields. We're working with older vines. Um, we're talking about blending in international grapes. In this particular case, about 20% Cabernet Sauvignon. Um, and, and we get to see what is, you know, we, let's regard this as a, what it is, an icon wine for Greece and one of the wines that helped to, it, it's the wine that, helped me find the Renaissance in Greece, quite frankly. I tasted that and said, oh my God, what's going on over there? But what's fascinating, to your point, Apostolos, when I was in Greece last summer, I was interviewing George, and I asked him a question that, uh, you know, he makes this wine. I asked him a question about Agirgitiko, because that's what he makes. I said, do you ever find yourself, you're this winemaker that wants to play with all these different things, do you ever find yourself getting bored working with only one grape? He said, mm -hmm. I didn't get bored in Burgundy, where I work <laughs> with only one grape. You know, he went to, it, it, does that not make, he went to University of Dijon, and he said, I don't get that. Yeah. He said, what is the most fascinating thing to me about Agirgitiko is every time I go over a hill, every time I cross a stream, every time I walk into a new valley, every time I see old vines on a different slope, I have different terroir, different exactly. aspect, different exactly. elevation, different steepness of the slope, and I find that my wine tastes different yeah. every time. So I not, not only do I never get bored, but I can't even decide if it should be rosé or my easy drinking red or my heavily oaked red or my big powerful icon wine or if it should be long term. And, and that to me is it, that it, excitement you were expressing earlier. You can make a lifetime wines there and never make the same wine twice if you want. Yeah. That's remarkable. And, and of it's course we should say, age. it is the biggest region. Yeah. Yeah. It, yeah. Has, you know, it is the most widely planted grape. grape. And grape. so many of Red us grape. tend to think, oh, well, if it's the biggest, yeah. and if it's the widest planted, then I, the, I don't need to help it, I'll work with the others. It's like, no, no. it's exciting. Yeah. What's going on right now, and the experimentation that's happening right now with yeah. crazy guys like you. And, yeah. and I, I just wanted to ask you if you would comment, I mean, this is a wine that is Agirgitico with a little bit of Cabernet. Okay, yeah. You no. came back and started doing some different things. And I'm wondering, don't we have the Magano? Yep. No, we have, uh, no, no, we no, have no. The this is, Oh, we have Grand Cuvée. This is 100% Agirgitico. 100%, I haven't oh, tasted it yet. Yeah, but it's 100%. George was making but I also. still, I, well, of course, he makes Magano, and yeah. this is absolutely one of my favorite wines on the planet. I'm going to tuck in there while you tuck. <laughs> But you came back with the idea of playing with this grape in different ways. Yeah. And you've been very successful at not only making great Agirgitico, but blending it with international varietals. Yeah. And the question that I have for you that I know, people ask me this all the time, why? Why would you do that? You know, we're trying to get you guys to work with the indigenous grapes and promote the indigenous grapes, and yet then you do a blend. Now, I know why, because I tasted your wine. Yeah. And to me, that's enough of an answer. But maybe you can talk a little more about how that happened and why you're doing it. Look, uh I believe that Agiogitico doesn't really need any help, mm. first of all. I believe also for the same thing for other Greek varieties. Uh, sometimes by using something else, some other red variety, maybe we give something that we want as the winemakers or something that our consumers want. Okay? But if you ask me honestly, my personal opinion, that's my personal opinion, not the Greek wine opinion, is for me at least, when I started making wine uh, 12 years ago, 13 years ago, I I blended a French variety of Agirgitico to help me in bring this wine into the United States. I mean, it was much easier for me to have people taste something that had Merlot inside then. than go straight ahead to Agirgitico. I was saying, taste my Agirgitico, they were saying, well, maybe. When I was saying, taste this Merlot with some Agirgitico, they were very willing to try it. That then they it. liked the wine and they said, okay, we, we love, we love this wine. What is wine? It's Merlot and uh, Yorgitico. Okay, let, can I try Yorgitico? So that was a way for me at least to start bringing Yorgitico in the market. And now, of course, I'm selling Yorgitico only. Only, yeah, because it's changed. Because it's changed. the evolution. Yeah. Yeah. So it was... That was then, yeah? That was yeah. then. That was then. Now, and now, now, it's, now it's only... Now if you want to sell a Greek wine in the mainstream yeah. market, they want indigenous grapes. But of course, uh, you know, with a, 
um, in, in all these upscale Greek restaurants or, or um, in other places. Not, not that there isn't a place, of course there is a place, because we make some really nice wines from international grapes and blends, but especially the sommelier, we've seen that they really um, uh, like uh, indigenous grapes. Or blends, the blends are popular. Well, let's, speaking of blending, uh, again, a grape that Should has I, been... Let's just clarify, yeah, to make sure if there's any Everybody confusion, this is Skouris Grand Cuvée, 100% Aguirgitico, um, very small plots on very, very high elevation, low yields, and old vines. Um, no, not Cabernet. I just want to make sure everybody understands what we're drinking in glass number five. And then in glass number six, if you haven't gotten into it, do that. Glass number six, now we're looking at Sino Mavro. And, and really, I should just turn the floor over to Angelos and to Stelios to speak about your experiences with this very, <laughs> very singular grape. Uh, Angelos, you want to start us? Speaking yeah. about the baby of the sommeliers. Yeah, This exactly. is the one, right? There are many, uh, let's say, versions of, uh, of uh, Xenomavro, and uh, Xenomavro growing, uh, growing in many different areas in uh, northern Greece, starting uh, from uh, Rapsani. Rapsani is the slope of Mount Olympus, Appalachian, going to the Gumenisa, which is a blend of uh, 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 Xenomavro with uh, Negoska, and then go to the famous Nausa, who is the most uh, 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 important production of Xenomavro uh, in Western Macedonia, and then going to Amindeo, which is the northern appellation in Greece. So uh, Amindio, uh, uh, the Xenomavro, of, uh, Xenomavro have many uh, <coughs> a style that grow, uh, that uh, the aromatic uh, evolution of Xenomavro from uh, young, starting as a, a small berry foresty fruits, going to dry fruits, prunes, uh, a, a nice spicy character, and in the end go, uh, give us uh, uh, dry tomatoes and uh, olive pate and uh, stuff like this. Very, very interesting variety, huge aging potential, and ni very nice acidity. And, and Stelios, uh, do you think that there are distinctive differences, let's say clonally, from Velvendos clone to Yanakahori clone? Is, is that, again, is that the, the, the dominant reason why we might see differences in savory elements in this one? Or, again, it's crazy to take one thread and call it the whole fabric? No, no, there's definitely that. Uh, uh, the, um, you see, with, 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 with Xenomavro, um, you know, it's I kind of have a love hate relationship with this with this grape <laughs> because you know it's been paying the bills for many many years. On the other hand, we haven't mastered it yet. You know, um, I think with Xenomavro, what you get, you get a, a, a fantastic unique nose. You know, <coughs> something that's very 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 unique. So this nose gives you a lot of expectations in the mouth. Unfortunately, sometimes it, it starts very nicely, it lets you down at one point, and then it hits you. Now, we try to change that. We try to make it a bit rounder. The, the, the taste is to start and finish it nicely with ripe tannins, good balance of acidity and, 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 and fruit. What we've been doing the last few years and coming back to the Velvendo um, 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 clone is that we have managed to bring earlier the, the harvest date so as to have phenolically mature grapes, not in like 20th of October, when we might lose the, 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 the vintage, but rather the end of September, beginning of October. Now, these wines, we don't have them. We haven't seen how they develop in 20 years. We strongly believe, though, that, uh, that they're going to have the aging potential, but at the same time, uh, they will keep uh, a fresh, strong, fragrant fruit. So we'll see. We'll see. We have a long way to go. Can I give you a secret for uh, Xenoma, bro? Uh, the secret for Xenoma, bro, is... Uh, mainly based uh, on the seed of Xenomavro. The maturity of the seed of Xenomavro is uh, related to the maturity of the wine they are producing. So, uh, uh, going to turning to the brown color seeds, you are, you, you, these are the biggest uh, vintage for, for Xenomavro variety. Is this, is this a grape that, uh, for, in order for uh, the American marketplace to completely embrace it, is this a grape that we should try to, t to make um, it, it drink in an aged style, in a very young and fresh style? Is it uh, that Sinomavro is, is another place in which there can be a, a sort of schism between the traditional school and the modern school? Uh, yeah, it's one of the questions that's come up in some of our Yeah, uh, there's a big debate. Online. It's like Barolo, yeah. you know, the, the, the new style and old style. You see, in the end of the day, you know, it's, wine is very subjective. 
you know, some people like it aged, some people like it fresh. You know, uh, uh, I, I, I think with Xenomavro, the most important thing is, is to bring out the fruit, this unique fruit, and master the tannins. What Angelo said is the most important, you know, making sure you bring the, uh, the harvest time at a time where the, 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 Seed. the, the seeds are not ripe, and, and, uh, are ripe, excuse me. <laughs> and that's, that's very often the problem, you know. Allow me. I, I see in the market uh, three styles of Xenomavro. I see the ma more rustic ones. Uh, then I see the more, uh, the recent years, more modern with more fruit and more uh, and, and, and higher uh, levels of alcohol. And I see some Xenomavros that are the bridge between the two styles. And it's, it's very distinctive. And it has to do also with the winemaker. I mean, um, you know, very beautiful rustic one is uh, Fundis Xenomavro. And then you have some other, you know, much more. Um, uh, fuller body and soft, you know, like Angelos is from Amindio, and then you have some between, like, like um, uh, Katoji and uh, Butari and uh, Caridas. I mean, it's every every winery uh, has um, different, I think. Uh, you, you know, uh, is uh, uh, it's a very fertile variety, so you have to manage the the yield mm -hmm. and, and the you canopy. Uh, uh, and the canopy. Yeah. Can so the canopy can management, certainly for Xenomabro, is a huge factor for uh, having a good result in, the, in that variety. And both of you do quite a bit of green harvest in most vintages, would you say? Yeah, every, every year is a green harvest. So a lot, right? A lot. I mean, don't, don't you get just overabundant yields if you're not you see, really, you see, really careful? That's the thing now with, with the new clones we're working. Now, suddenly you, say, you have these like, smaller bunches. Evenly, evenly sized berries, quite loose, so you don't have a problem with disease, uh, much smaller, so, uh, and if you managed through pruning to keep the low yield, then you have a better result. Then you can avoid sometimes uh, uh, green harvest, but you're going to have like 30 hectoliters per hectare, you know. <laughs> Little tiny yields, yeah. <laughs> Very low yields. So, so one of the questions that came up, uh, Alexander uh, Pappas had asked the question of uh, that, you know, we're looking at some of uh, the two really famous red grapes, but when we start talking about some of the spicy, sweet, and, and savory dishes, moussaka or what have you, um, how, how should we think about these red wines in juxtaposition to some of these classic Greek dishes? Now, I, I would grab the question and twist it and say, who cares about classic dishes? How would we take these wines and place them on the American table? What, you know, how should one think about how these wines interact with any food? Big question, I know, but go for it. <laughs> no, but I, I want to say something um, uh, sim similar. My answer is going to be similar to that. Um, we all think that Burgundy is a great wine for the table, or Nebbiolo, or Barolo. Well. Xenomavro is the same style of, of wine and grape, and, and of course, uh, um, because it's not because Greek wines are not so recognized yet, the pricing are so much lower than than all the most well-known um, appellations uh, in the world. So, um, Sophia, to your point, yes, same style meaning high acid, soft, sweet exactly. tannins, yes. velvety in the yes. mouth, texturally similar, uh -huh. obviously. It's the not like Pinot Noir nor no, Barolo, no. and yet no. it's that, that yes. area of yes. wine drinking. Yeah. So it's it's very what, food friendly. What right? are you going to eat with a Barolo? Yeah. What are you going to eat with a yeah. Barolo? You can, you can enjoy it with an the Xenomavro. No. I, I have to say, I find Xenomavro personally, and there are a lot of different styles, but I find it incredibly versatile with food. I mean, as a matter of fact, um, a couple of years ago at the Telluride Wine Festival, Kat Cora threw a wrench into the works and said, I'm going to do this sea bass and I'm using capers and lemon confit, and it's gonna be on a salad, and I'm like, but I wanted to do Xenomavro with the main, you remember this, right? I wanna do this with the main course, and I went, why wouldn't I? Yeah, take and I put it out there, and everyone thought it was crazy. I had three expressions of Xenomavro served with a, basically a poached white fish. Now, sea bass has some body to it, so it yeah. worked. It was amazing. People went insane for well, it. The capers went a different. The capers. They brought it all in. I was going to say, take care of it. Well, I mean, we were sitting tasting wine yesterday in the Xenoma Row with, with olives. Mm -hmm. What wine can you drink with olives? Mm -hmm. you know, besides Xenoma Pinot Sherry. Xenoma smells well, olives. The, the, Xenoma the, is olives. Maybe. Yeah, indeed. It, and smells it, it has yeah. that savory element, it, but the saltiness will buffer some of the tannins. The, the thing that I find exciting about all of these red wines is this notion that these higher acid 
red wines can work with seafood, can work with vinegars, can yes. work with elements that we say, oh, well, I'm not sure a red wine is ideal for this. Yes, it, for me at least, I find it, it, it's something that, that works um, frequently. There's a question that's popped up though, uh, we're gonna kind of head back into the vineyard on this one a little bit, and that was questioning the, the, uh, about the vineyards themselves, about trellising or head pruned or you know what sort of, of uh, vine architecture, aside from a crazy place like Santarini, um, what sort of vine architecture is typical there and why? Anyone? Why? We can go to each region. Double, 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 yeah. Yeah. double right here is the most common uh, system, uh, trellis system. And because, uh, uh, in my point of view, it brings balance to the vine. So uh, you can control much more better uh, the, corp, the crop, you, uh, the canopy. So uh, you're achieving the high results and uh, you have a, a, a good exploitation of the uh, sun. And uh, so it works perfect uh, for Greece, at, at least all over Greece. One of the things that we mentioned earlier is this idea of heat versus sun and ripeness. Uh, we've talked about canopy management, but just um, maybe you can talk a little bit about this idea that, you know, sun ripens grapes even more so than heat. And we have a lot of sun in Greece. And the higher in altitude you go, the closer you get to the sun, even though it's cooler. So maybe talk, I mean, I, w I was amazed the first time I was in Montania that the great, the, the leaves are like elephant's ears, <laughs> you know, the <laughs> most, biggest leaves. leaves I've ever seen in They're my very life. Thick. And they and they literally are like little umbrellas yeah. over the vines yeah. to keep them from burning. Yeah. Absolutely. Because you're you know you're up several hundred meters, exactly. thousand meters, um, and you're close to the sun, and you want to have these cool, high acid, low alcohol wines. Exactly. So canopy management becomes it's a big it's issue to you, right? Super important in yeah. every vineyard in the world. It's very important, very very important. And if you have to, I mean, at, at years you have to delief. You make sure you delief on the east side, yeah. so you get the nice uh, morning sun. But make sure you don't delief from the west side because everything's going to get burned. You know, it's uh, that's that's one. Uh, I mean, I'm, 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 we're not we're not inventing anything here. I mean, it's no, <laughs> it's common but, sense. But it's even more important, I think, in Greece with all this yeah. the sun. I think one of the reasons that very often you don't have a, a Merlot or a Cabernet that early ripening wines, uh, gra grapes, and are not doing so well in Greece is that because of the sun and the heat. You know, you, you get like very quickly a um, uh, high alcohol level without being ripe. And that's, that, that, can, that can be a problem. Well, the, these grapes, these vines have obviously adapted to their terroir and to their conditions. I mean, to be able to make wines of this kind of balance and acidity and low alcohol, it requires that these vines are not only old, but that they've been yeah. there right. Right. adapting right. for a very, very long time. Yeah. For example, uh, uh, it's not uh, by accident that 70% uh, of the Santorini vineyard is acidical. It's the most uh, strong one Stronger. to survive, and uh, uh, that's, that's why. Uh, one of the questions that... Natural selection. Yes, natural, natural selection. selection. In, yes. in fact, uh, Sophia, uh, curious in anyone, but uh, obviously curious about your thoughts on this as well. Joe Power was asking if it's, it isn't his imagination, but it seems to him that a Certico is becoming less astringent, is becoming a little bit rounder. It, you know, is this true? Do you think this is true? You know, are we, are we seeing a slight morphing of style with regards to a Certico's intense acidity? Well, um, there are different wineries also. I, I wouldn't say astringent. Um, mm -hmm. I, I would say um, it, it has to do more with the minerality or, uh, and, and the acidity and, and the style yeah. of winemaking. Exactly. And uh, it's, it's very distinctive. Um, I have the pleasure of working, uh, of knowing um, uh, the wineries and, and going often to Sandorini. And it's, uh, after a while, you, you, you uh, understand and appreciate the different styles of, of all the wineries. One might be a little bit more softer, fuller. The other might be a little bit more mineral. The other has a bracing acidity. Uh, so, so it has to do all, uh, also with the uh, with the winemaking. Indeed. Well, there, uh, you know, kind of a uh, you know, if you will, softball question was provided. Now let's try a little bit of more of a hardball question. There were several questions that came in asking about what wines impact upon the Greek economy is, what wines' role is within the Greek economy and its export, uh, uh, you know, efforts at this point in time. Uh, do you mind speaking to that? Who, who wants well, I think, to speak? Uh, I think yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, I have to tell you, you know, there, there's no such thing as bad, as bad publicity. You know, we're getting uh, <laughs> nice. incredible publicity the last the last few years, especially the last year. Um, however, what has been happening is that uh, 
people, um, journalists, um, reporters, wine shop owners, restaurant tours, whatever, are, are trying to find the good things in Greece. You know, not everything is bad. You know, and there are many, many good things. Uh, I think wine is one of the good things. Uh, as I said earlier, there's a revolution. You know, wines are becoming better. Uh, our producers have becoming much more extrovert. Um, I think wine is, is one of the things that will change the, the image of Greece uh, um, uh, overseas. Uh, it, 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 it definitely is one of those products that can really change hands, you know, and it's, and it's not a planned thing. It has to, it, it will come, it will just come, I think. And it's, and, it's and, will. Wine, <laughs> and it's not only wine, it's in general Greek products. This is Greece, you know, we have fabulous cheeses, the best probably olive oil in the world. We've got uh, herbs, we've got, um, we've got um, honey, you know, that it's unparalleled. I mean, but this is, and, all, all and tourism, is you know, and the, pro the produce yes. is crazy. What I would like I mean, to say is that also that the people that consist the Greek industry, uh, the Greek wine industry, excuse me, I don't know, maybe it's the product, maybe it's the, the interaction with the, the, with the people, with the earth, with the vines. I, I think it's one of the only sectors in the, in the Greek economy, at least, that work together. Yeah. And uh, really can, I mean, I'm here and I'm tasting Moscofilor from my very good friend, Yanni Tselepo. but it's not my Moscofilor, but I'm so happy to talk about it. And the same goes with every guy here. I mean, yeah. I don't think we are more mature than other um, industries in Greece, so I think that yeah, helped us, and uh, it's helping us to su survive and go ahead. One, one question that popped up, I, I think maybe speaks to that, which is several people have wanted to know, okay, so I want to go to Greece, how do I go about uh, arranging that, how do I, where do I go, uh, other than Call everywhere? Her. <laughs> Call that lady. <laughs> <laughs> Email. Google <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Well, as a matter of fact, to that end, we're on, yeah. on our way to Greece to do a symposium for sommeliers and, and media there um, in Crete this year. Um, and in addition, I mean, I, I just have to New throw a plug out. We've got Celebrate Greek Wine happening in New York City for a couple of weeks where uh, we have close to a hundred restaurants all serving Greek wine and embracing this idea of Greek wine on the table with food which we are just thrilled about because you think about where we were a decade ago and where we are today and the fact that all of you and and really an entire nation of wine drinkers are starting to learn about this and starting to embrace it and of course the people that are tuned into this right now are some of the people that have helped to really push this forward and really make it which we thank you for um, I would say you should all go to Greece if you haven't, and if you don't get through to her, get through to us, you know how to find us online, and we'll, we'll help get you there somehow, because I guarantee you, everyone at this table and all of the other Greek winemakers that we're speaking on behalf of would all love to see people who are interested in wine come to their vineyards. I, I have to say, you mentioned people. For me, I think the single most important thing that I've learned in my years of working with you and traveling back and forth to Greece is that it really is an industry of people. Um, and you know, when you can put a name and a face and a terroir and a region to these grapes and to these glasses, it just changes the way you think about it. And I don't know of anywhere in the world where people are more hospitable, more welcoming, more friendly, that are more eager to show you what they do and what they have and who they are. Um, and it's, it's remarkable. And, I would just like to go back to where we were as we close this thing down. I, I set this as kind of a premise for and our it's safe, seminar. Too. And it is safe, it is yes, safe. it's absolutely. This, Don't this think is of it. It's a question we have to answer. Greece, it is, Greece absolutely. Is very safe. Hey, we're going back next week. So. <laughs> Gladly. That's why I can't wait. We were talking about it. He's spending more days there than me, and I'm very upset. But I set this premise that, you know, in, it's our opinion, and I know all of yours, that these are not just wines of place. They are truly wines of place, but they are also unique and different from any other wine in the world. Not only the indigenous grapes, but everything about them are unique, and, and it will take time to get people to embrace them. But the fact of the matter is, people already are starting to embrace them. So I, I would like to go back to what Stelio says. You know, I, we always want to use the term renaissance, but I think in this case, as a country of anarchists, <laughs> we are talking about a true revolution of winemaking. Yeah. The winemaking has gotten so incredibly brilliant. Um, Doug, what do you think? Are we, are we talking about wines of place here? Yeah, indeed, if we are, then these deserve a place at the table. So we hope you've enjoyed this time with us, certainly, the winemakers uh, could, could be contacted for further questions 
Um, we have a lot of questions that we didn't get a chance to get to, but that's what email is for, okay? That's, you know, the interwebs, okay? Let's do this, let's use this, let's taste these, and maybe let's show these wines to people again. Think about it, 4,000 oh, years of culture of food and wine on the table. So, you know, huge thank you, Stelios, Angelos, Sophia, Apostoles, for coming all the way from Greece and doing this with us. And thank you to all of you for tuning thank in you. today. Thank you. Cheers. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Cheers. Enjoy good wines. Cheers. Yes. Yes. Yes.